Hi, my name is Alexis and I'm an environmental science student at Half Moon Bay High School. I want to study the environment because I love to be outdoors and explore nature and I really enjoy learning about our planet and ways we can take care of it. Hi, I'm Sam. I think it's important to learn about nature so we can take care of it. Hi, I'm Ellie and I like taking care of animals in nature. Today we are going to be learning about some of the biggest mammals of the coastside. I hope you enjoy! Hello, thanks everybody for joining today um, to learn a little bit more about our local big cats um, called pumas. I am Courtney. I am the primary investigator for the Bay Area Puma Project, which is the flagship project of Fila Day Conservation Fund. So we're going to start with um, some basics and just talk about what a puma is. So pumas are kind of tricky because they actually have over 40 different names in English alone. So, and this is because um, pumas live all over South America and over a great majority of North America and um, indigenous people everywhere had their own names for the cats. And um, we've anglicized many of them. Um, so you may know them as a mountain lion or a cougar. Um, throughout this presentation, I call them pumas uh, because that is their genus name. So because they live all over um, North and South America, we see a lot of variation in pumas from one place to another. They can range in color from a very light blonde or even gray color all the way to a really dark red or brown color. Um, as kittens, they have spots. So you may see some sub-adults with some pattern um, in their fur as well. So lots of variation in shape, in size, and in color in these cats, which can um, make them hard to identify from time to time. And they are not to be confused with the other wild cat that we have here in California, which is the bobcat. Um, you can tell these two apart um, primarily based on size. Pumas are quite a bit bigger um, in the 70 to 150 pound range, whereas bobcats tend to be um, much smaller in the 15 to 25 pound range. Um, if you're looking at them walking away from you, the easiest way to tell is by looking at the tail. Um, a puma will have a long, long tail, as long as their body, at least. Um, and bobcats will have a short little bobbed tail, hence their name. Um, according to the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, something between 75 and 95 percent of all mountain lion sightings are actually not mountain lions. Um, they're deer, they're house cats, they're bog cats, they're coyotes. Um, so just keep that in mind. These cats are very hard to spot. Um, they are pretty scared of people and um, tend to be out at night um, and away from people if they can. So a little bit of background biology and ecology on these guys. Um, as you can tell by where they live here, colored in orange on the map, um, they really can, they're really um, able to live in lots of different types of habitats, pretty much anywhere with vegetative cover. So that could be a forest, that could be chaparral, um, that could be scrublands of different sorts, um, high in the mountains and deep in the deserts. Um, pumas tend to be solitary, so that means they live and hunt alone, um, with the caveat that um, females will keep their kittens with them for one to two years in, in times of drought or other harsh climates. They'll maybe even stay with their moms up until three years. So if you see a group of pumas together, it's likely a mom with her um, kittens, um, which may be the same size as her. Pumas eat lots of different types of wildlife. Um, we say from mouse to moose. Um, around California, we see them eating mule deer, 
um, somewhere between 60 and 90% of the time, depending on the individual. Um, that means, that, and they end up eating about one deer a week, but they don't eat it all at the same time. They eat just little piece, pieces of it at a time, and they do what we call caching, which is they bury it with leaves to try to keep scavengers um, from eating it or um, too much rot from occurring. So that, and they eat the yummiest parts first, the parts that tend to go bad first, um, and, and save the rest for later. So now that we know a little bit about what pumas are, um, I'm gonna try to convince you why we should care about them. Um, and for me, I think the most important thing is that they're really important in regulating the ecosystems where they live, um, like all other apex predators. Um, and they have a really complex um, role to play in that they tend to eat the largest herbivore in whatever ecosystem that they live in. So in California, they eat mule deer. Um, in the central parts of the United States, they'll eat um, white-tailed deer. Um, in the northern part of the United States, they'll eat um, even elk or caribou from time to time, depending on where they are. Um, and these herbivores play really important roles in the ecosystem as well in that they eat grass and if there are too many of them, they will overeat that grass. Um, if there's just the right amount, then they eat just the right amount and they can help balance the ecosystem um, and create diversity so that other small species can cohabitate. Um, and the, the best way to really think about it is by looking at a really well-studied system um, in Yellowstone National Park, so near the center of the country, um, and wolves, which play a very similar role in the ecosystem that pumas do. Um, in Yellowstone, um, this picture shows kind of a, a well-functioning ecosystem with lots of biodiversity. But for a long time in Yellowstone, um, wolves were extirpated from that park. They were hunted until they weren't present there anymore. And the ecosystem was really falling apart. Um, the elk populations grew um, far too big. They ate down all of the grass, um, which meant that there was no habitat for um, amphibians, so frogs or small birds. Um, they also ate the grass at the banks so that um, the river banks collapsed and made the water really dirty um, so that a lot of fish and animals that relied on clean water couldn't survive. Um, as wolves were reintroduced to the system, we saw this rebalancing and um, the ecosystem recovered and went back to the way it should have been. And, and pumas play this very similar, similar role in um, regulating all aspects of the ecosystem. More directly, their um, pumas prey feeds other species. And this can be really direct. So for example, this is a video we took. Um, this is a deer carcass that um, a puma killed and was gonna come back to later, um, but it's being scavenged on by not just a coyote, but also a bobcat. So things like um, vultures or eagles may also come down and scavenge directly on puma kills. Um, more indirectly, whatever is left behind after uh, a puma makes a kill, um, that's going to be fed on by beetles and bugs and things that decompose um, carcasses and that actually enriches the soil which allows for greater plant diversity which means um, more seeds and more food available for um, small rodents and birds and so forth. So you can see um, both directly and indirectly pumas kills um, really power 
a lot of the ecosystem. And then this last point is a little bit harder to wrap your head around. Um, and it really comes from the behavior of pumas and cats in general. Cats, if you've lived with a cat or know somebody who has a cat and spent a lot of time with them, you know they're pretty lazy. They sleep a lot. And that actually is to the benefit of the, their prey. And I'll show you how that happens. So let's think about a population of mule deer. Um, and let's imagine that there's a disease going around. Um, I'll, I'll, let's say that this, um, we can visualize this disease with a green colored deer. And it's an infectious disease. So when a deer comes in contact with other deer, it may spread that disease um, and it might pass through the entire population. Um, some of them might get sick and die and um, have other effects and consequences. Now let's imagine in this population we also have an apex predator like a puma and that puma um, takes down a sick animal and they will naturally choose prey that are sick because these um, individuals tend to be slower or um, less alert. They're just easier to take down in general. So if a puma takes down one of these, it means that that individual can't infect other individuals in that population. So it actually keeps the population of their prey healthier um, just based on the fact that Pumas are lazy kitties and like to take down easy prey. So um, that's a really important role to play in the ecosystem as well. So hopefully with that information, I've convinced you that it's worth caring about pumas, that they play an integral role in the ecosystems where they occur. So here's the problem. Pumas are going locally extinct here in the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, and that's a big problem because it means that they can't provide those ecosystem services we were just talking about. And the reason that they're declining are multifold. So I'm gonna kind of go through the reasons why um, they're being lost here in the San Francisco Bay Area. And one of the main reasons is through a process called habitat fragmentation. Pumas like to live in vegetated areas. We talked about this a little bit earlier. They like to live in forested, deep, densely forested areas. Um, what happens in habitats like ours is um, that this core vegetated habitat gets fragmented, gets split into two. And this can be for um, many different reasons. Um, the most obvious would be something like a road goes through there or housing development is built in there. But it might also be a wildfire or something more indirectly affected um, or direct, indirectly caused by climate change, like say um, a severe rain event causes um, a washout in that area or a mudslide or something like that. Um, regardless, this fragmentation does occur and it has important consequences. Um, if the area is small enough and a pumas can, but a puma still lives there, it may be going back and forth between these two core areas. Now, imagine if it's being split up by a road or housing development, that means that that puma is going to come into contact with people a lot more frequently just because it has to get from one side to the other um, and that is inherently risky for the puma especially if it's crossing a road it might get hit by a car or um, it might um, be hunted in the areas where humans are um, there's also harder to understand effects that have to do with genetic diversity which um, means maybe mates are having a hard time getting from one green area to the other and that can have important effects for the entire population. 
Um, another main threat, especially in the San Francisco Bay Area, is has to do with roadkill. So um, a lot of the habitat fragmentation that pumas experience in the Bay Area has to do with interstates and highways. Um, and to get from one area to another, they end up crossing a lot of roads. Um, and so it's, it's often the case that they are hit by cars. Um, pumas are technically protected species in um, California. So they are not legally allowed to be hunted. However, if someone has a cat or a goat that is taken by a wild animal, um, whether or not it's a puma or a coyote or a raccoon even, um, a raccoon might take um, a house cat or a small dog, not a goat, but um, if you lose a domestic animal, you can report that to the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. Um, if they suspect that it could be a puma, they can come out, confirm it, and write you a permit and allow you to kill the puma, whether or not it is proven um, that the puma took your domestic animal or not. Poisoning is also um, a, a major threat to pumas in California and um, throughout their range. And it's typically through this um, bioaccumulation. So not a direct poisoning per se, but um, here's an example. So you have some small rodents that are um, destroying something in your garage. You put out some rodent poison. Most of those rodent poisons don't kill the rodents immediately. So the rodents end up going out in your backyard or out into an open space and dying. Um, either before they've died or just after they can, they might be scavenged on by um, bobcats, coyotes, raccoons, gray fox. And just one of these um, rodents probably won't harm any of these larger animals, but if they eat three or four or five of them, you see this bioaccumulation of poison within this carnivore. Um, and that can really affect them. It usually won't kill them outright, but it makes them more susceptible to other infections. It, it's something that we call being immunocompromised, which is a very hard word to say, um, which just means that your immune system isn't working the way that it should. And you might be infected with things that um, a normal healthy animal wouldn't be. And we've seen this directly. This is, um, this puma's name is P22. He lives down in LA. The first time he was caught, he had mange, which is why he looks so scruffy and yucky on his face. Um, pumas do not typically get mange. Um, it's caused by either a bacteria or an insect, but it affects their skin. And the reason that this puma had mange is because its immune system was being compromised by rodenticides. Um, the community got really upset about this and they really took it upon themselves to stop using these um, rodent poisons locally. And sure enough, P22 um, got better and he is a very handsome puma now. And this um, has really led to a movement in California and actually a bill was just passed last month in um, the, by the state to make these, some of these rodent poisons illegal in California for this very reason that they affect, um, they bioaccumulate in carnivores. So that's a really nice um, recent victory on this front. So I mentioned earlier that it is technically illegal to hunt pumas in the state of California, but we know that this still happens even though it's illegal. Um, the problem is we have no idea how frequently it occurs because it's illegal, um, but we know it's a problem. And then 
lastly, you might be asking yourselves, what about um, pumas that have to be killed because they're a public safety threat? So they're um, threatening people, people's lives or their livelihoods in some way or another. Um, and to that, it's, it's very rare. Um, it happens maybe, maybe once a year on average, um, usually less than that. Um, it's very unlikely to have a direct negative interaction with a puma. Um, attacks are incredibly rare, especially in California, for whatever reason. Um, in fact, you're much more likely to be struck by lightning than you are to be attacked by a puma. So we know that pumas are important, but we know that their numbers are declining um, in the San Francisco Bay Area. So what can we do? So the Bay Area Puma Project uses multiple different types of tools to deal with this. Um, we use education to talk to people that cohabitate with pumas. Um, and that's what we're doing right now. We're teaching you about what the risks are um, and what the rewards are um, of living with pumas and other wildlife. Um, before COVID, we were doing a lot of direct outreach through tabling um, and other means. And we also have a very active research program. So this is my job within the organization. Um, a lot of our research is done through the use of wildlife cameras or camera traps, which is what this picture is. Um, we put these up in different types of habitats so that we can monitor where pumas occur, um, their activity, and also what other wildlife um, are present. And with that um, photo data, we can do a lot of really cool things, um, asking about how healthy they are, how much fat deposition they have on their bodies, um, so where, where they live, where their preferred habitat is. Um, and we can also try to answer some questions about um, how we can help them move safely through the fragmented habitat in the San Francisco Bay Area. But what you do is also really important and you have lots of different tools to help pumas as well. Um, what we're doing today, learning about pumas and learning how to coexist with pumas um, and how to help them move safely through fragmented habitat is an incredibly important thing you can do. Um, talking to your family and talking to your community about um, the risks and benefits of living with pumas. Um, we also need to try our best to keep pumas in wildland areas, and that means trying to keep them out of urban areas because that's really dangerous for them. Um, so trying not to feed or attract other wildlife in your yard means that pumas aren't gonna be attracted to prey that are in your yard. So making sure deer stay out of your yard, keeping raccoons out of your garbage, very important. Also keeping your pets and domestic animals safe, keeping, keeping cats indoors. Um, keeping chickens in a coop, um, protecting livestock with guard dogs. And we have more information on our website about all of these options. And then lastly, doing your part to protect wild spaces and public lands, because this is where pumas um, are most able to be pumas. So keeping um, these wildland areas um, intact and clean is very important. And then the last thing is um, you can help us collect data for our research. Um, help us track pumas and bobcats. On our website, we have a map where you can add your sightings. So if you see a puma or a bobcat when you're out hiking, or if you have your own camera trap in your backyard, um, or if you see one reported on social media, 
you can submit that to our website and we use it in our research. So um, that concludes the presentation. Um, I think that together we can protect um, wildlife and wildlands and pumas and um, really keep our ecosystem healthy. Um, if you have questions, you can send me an email. This is my email address, Courtney Kuhn at feelitafund.org, or you can check out our website for more information. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Hope you enjoyed. Talk to you later. Welcome back, everybody. Since we know so much about predators, prey, and the food chain, we're going to test our skills in a game called Eat or Be Eaten. In this card game, we're going to be making food chains. Based on the information given to you on your cards, you will have to match predators and their prey in order based on who eats who. The objective of the game is to make the longest food chain out of your, you and your partner. Let's get started. To get started, we're going to need one pair of scissors, a scorecard per person, a full set of the eat or be eaten cards per pair, a rule sheet per pair, and something to write with. First, we're going to cut out the playing cards that have the different species on them. Cut around the dotted lines. There should be 39 total playing cards when they are all cut out. Now, have some fun mixing up and shuffling up all the cards so that they aren't in order and it makes the game a little bit more challenging. Taking turns, each player will pick up a card and read the card out loud to the group. Then put it face up in front of you so that the other players can see your cards as well. Once each person takes a turn, we can take another card out of the stack to start your food chain. Or you can steal another player's card if you think that the species will fit into your food chain. For example, player one took a card out of the stack and they made a food chain because a web spinning spider eats butterflies. Now player two is going to steal player one's card because they have a match. In this game, the mouse will eat any human food available, which means they can eat the leftover lunch. We can steal another player's card if their species fits into our food chain. The only rule is you cannot take another person's card if they already have a food chain with the card in it. Keep taking turns until the cards run out. You can make as many food chains as you like, but remember the objective is to make the longest food chain. Look back at the rules if you get confused. Don't forget to fill out your scorecards at the end of the game. Fill in your longest food chain at the top and then figure out how many total points you've earned. You can calculate the total points for the rest of your food chains on the back of the card. If your food chain has more than four species, you get to add two extra points to your final score. For example, if I have made a food chain with five animals and plants, my total is going to be seven points because I got to add two extra points. After you fill out your scorecard, add up the totals of your food chains and see who won. If you ever get stuck throughout the game, just refer back to the rule sheet and it'll talk about everything I just did in the video. Finally, you guys can go and play the game. I hope you guys had a lot of fun learning about something new today. And I also hope you guys have a fun time playing this at home just like I did. Thank you so much for paying attention to this project and I hope you guys have a great day. Bye guys!
This game was super fun and I love to learn about which animals eat which insects and plants. And I hope you guys could try this out and have fun making it. I hope you enjoyed the video.